Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, we're really fortunate to have an amazing speaker today, um, an expert and a leader in the field of cardiac imaging and cardiac CT, Dr. Todd Valines. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Valines, who is the Julian Ruffin Beckwith Distinguished Professor of Medicine at the University of Virginia. He's a clinical cardiologist, a multimodality cardiac imaging expert, and a researcher with a focus on cardiac imaging and prevention. Dr. Valines completed his undergraduate training at the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. He attended medical school at the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma City, and then completed his internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at the Walter Reed Medical Centers in Washington, DC and Bethesda, Maryland. At Walter Reed, he went on to serve as the fellowship program director and director of cardiovascular research and cardiac CT. Dr. Valines retired from active duty military service after achieving the rank of Colonel in the US Army. During his greater than 20 years of service, he deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, where he was awarded the Bronze Star as well as other decorations. He is currently editor in chief of the Journal of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography. He's the immediate past president, a uh, past chair of the ACC Imaging Section and Leadership Council. And he is also a recent past president of the Society of Cardiovascular CT. He has published more than 200 peer reviewed manuscripts, three books, eight book chapters, many in high impact journals such as Jack, New England Journal, European Heart Journal, and Circulation. And he's an absolutely wonderful speaker. So we're all greatly looking forward to his presentation today. Todd, thank you so much for visiting with us virtually. I hope we get the chance to host you in person in the future. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for that overly kind introduction. And it is, it is such a pleasure to be uh, with you this morning and such, such an honor to be a part of, of, you know, really one of the leaders in, in, in academic cardiology and in imaging in the world, and that is at Yale and, and, and amongst, amongst friends. And I had the, the good fortune of, of, of working somewhat with, with Lauren when she was in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and with, with Ed Miller, who was uh, once a colleague and, of course, uh, collaborating with many of your faculty now, uh, working with David Herr. And so I feel like I'm among friends, and I hope this will be a, a really fun uh, and lively discussion. And, you know, the topic today is one that I think is very timely. Um, and, you know, the, the, the evolving role of, of, of not just coronary CTA, which I'll focus on in, in this talk, but also the evolving role of, of, of how we do imaging for, for, for patients with chest pain in the United States. And, and we, of course, all of you are probably familiar already with the new guidelines that were recently published. And we'll spend much of our time focused on that and talk a little bit off also about how these uh, evolving guidelines influence things like training fellows. And as Lauren mentioned, I was uh, for six years a fellowship program director and I'm working very closely with our, our advanced imaging fellowship here at UVA as well as our general cardiology fellows. And, and you know, the evolving role of training uh, and training the next generation of both general cardiologists and those who with, uh, with an interest in imaging. Um, and you know, we work very closely with our radiology colleagues with an integrated program here and, and how we train radiology residents uh, in the future as well. I think these guidelines have a direct impact. With regards to disclosures, I have no relationships with industry. My only conflicts, as, as you heard, is that I do editorial work for the Journal of Cardiovascular CT, as well as uh, a few other imaging journals. And just by way of disclosure, while I'm focusing on CT today, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, like many of you, I think most imagers don't just do one modality. I spend just as much time, if not more, reading echo and nuclear uh, cardiology here at UVA, and and so um, have a have and have a busy clinical practice. And so. Um, I, I, I certainly don't just practice cardiac CT, although that's what bulk of my research uh, is. I mentioned already the recent guidelines, and I'm going to come back to this uh, throughout the talk and talk about what is new, what has changed, and how has anatomic imaging um, evolved with regards to its place in our current guidelines. Um, and so most of you, you know, if you go back in time, I was talking before we got started with Lauren about how, you know, back when I was a, a, a general cardiology fellow, and Alan Taylor, my boss and program director, you know, we had done calcium scoring research and we're very interested in doing uh, coronary CT angiography and starting a cardiac CT program. And I had the good fortune of going and spending several months at the Washington Hospital Center um, back in uh, the early part of 2005 when I was a, a senior general cardiology fellow and you know, came back to Walter Reed and, and, and you know, got the good fortune of, of, of getting to help start a program. And you know, I think um, you know, 
Alan Taylor used to always tell me, you know, sometimes you find your niche and sometimes your niche finds you. And it was a modality that no one really else, no one, none of the other faculty at Walter Reed had any interest in really doing um, at the time. And, you know, of course it was met with a lot of hype. And so of course this Time Magazine uh, article, you know, how you can stop a heart attack before it happens, but it was also met with a lot of resistance and a lot of problems with the early technology with regards to its radiation dose. Um, and uh, really just how to use this technology. We just really didn't know. Um, if you go back in time, and I'm gonna come back to the 2021 guidelines, where have we come with regards to prior iterations of guidelines? Well, as you know, the, the guideline that I showed you is the first to address specifically the symptom of chest pain. Um, and so it was unique in that role. It's the first guideline of its type to really focus on patients with a symptom, whether it be acute or chronic, as opposed to a more, um, differentiated diagnosis such as uh, stable ischemic heart disease or, or possible in ACS or definitive ACS. If you go back to the 2012 and, 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 and was updated in 2014, uh, ma management of patients with stable ischemic heart disease. We know that ischemia tests were clearly prefer preferred. Exercise ECG was preferred, particularly if there's no prior revascularization and the patient can exercise and they have an interpretable EKG as long as they weren't high pretest risk. Now the concept of pretest risk in this, this older guideline was based on the traditional Diamond Forrester CAS pretest probability tables that I think many of you practically memorized. Um, and you know, this had its issues being derived in a relatively high risk population going to the cath lab several decades ago now. Um, amongst functional tests, stress echo and stress spec were the preferred imaging tests. Um, they were the foundational tests. Um, and this is kind of where we had been. In fact, it was kind of frustrating for many of us in the field that this guideline essentially had not been updated um, in nearly a decade, despite changes in a lot of, 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 of technology, as you're, as you're all aware of. If you look in patients, um, where did CT fit? It was really a test of last resort. Uh, you could do it if you really couldn't do anything else. If you had consistent, you know, con persistent symptoms despite prior testing and were not high risk enough to go to the cath lab, if for some reason you couldn't undergo a functional test um, or you had inconclusive results of that, it was really a test of last resort. And this, of course, was based on the literature base at that time, and it was very appropriate to have this level of recommendation. If you look in the 2014 uh, non-ST elevation AC possible ACS patient population, um, and, you know, it was, again, a, a 2A recommendation based on some randomized clinical trials done prior to this guideline, but it was really reserved for patients who were super low risk, who presented to the ED, who had normal ECG, normal troponins, no history of coronary disease, and it was only in a pathway of patients in whom you preferred an early diagnosis pathway within three hours of arrival of making, of doing for, uh, formal testing, which was certainly not the standard at most emergency rooms around uh, the world. And so where have we come? So I think what has changed since this time um, back when I was training in CT has been that the technology has significantly evolved. And so we've gotten used to seeing high resolution images of coronary arteries, um, in this case, a normal, a normal, normal coronary arteries at low, relatively low radiation doses and relatively low contrast doses, much different than when, when many of us first started training doing 16 slice coronary CT. And of course, one of the values, I think from a clinical perspective, is its ability to not just do luminography, the ability to see with high resolution, the overall whole heart atherosclerotic burden, and to try to integrate that into your patient management, uh, being a three-dimensional atherosclerosis imaging technique. And I think this is really, I'm going to come back to this, this ability, so to speak, of seeing both angiographically significant stenosis, but also non-obstructive atherosclerosis. And how does that impact your management? And of course, many of you are used to seeing, you know, uh, pictures like this. In fact, much of the early literature on CT was geared around, is it accurate compared to angiography, invasive angiography with CAP? Um, and that was really where, where the focus was. And I think we've shifted hopefully now with this guideline from beyond just looking at stenosis and the importance of non-obstructive plaque. Now, considering Invasive angiography, I think many of you are training and many of your fellows are, are you look at these every single day. Um, we know, I, I, I would really challenge you all to start thinking of coronary CT angiography as a non-invasive angiogram, a cath. Um, you know, I think we, for many years, have thought of invasive angiography as the gold standard and that we have to confirm any finding that's abnormal on coronary non-invasive CT angiography with an invasive 
angiogram. I'm going to come back to talking about the medical management of what we see in the CT lab and having the courage to treat these patients because they've had an angiogram. Now, it's, a not, it's an imperfect uh, test like most. Um, has very good spatial resolution, um, fairly, fairly comparable to invasive angiography. Of course, the advantage I mentioned earlier is that, you know, what appear to be normal coronaries, we can often see small degrees of atherosclerosis. And so this concept of what's normal with CT relative to in, uh, invasive angiography, the biggest limitation, of course, is temporal resolution. And we know that an image such as this on the left typically will require anywhere from 60 to 160 milliseconds to acquire. And this of course requires exquisite patient pep preparation and a focus on quality. So as we look towards the guidelines, I wanna walk us through some of the evidence that I think um, the guideline writers used in making these recommendations. And I was involved in the guideline with, as a reviewer, both as an official reviewer for the ACC uh, and during a second iteration of the guidelines an official reviewer for the Society of Cardiovascular CT. And so when we, really, this is kind of a cool slide to show and so anyone who's been training in CT is that when, when we first started doing this, people said these are really pretty pictures that require a lot of radiation and contrast, and you really don't have any evidence that this technology does much for patients. Um, you don't have effectiveness, comparative effectiveness trials. You don't have much in the way of accuracy and particularly in the way of prognosis and changing how you manage patients to show that this technology actually is effective for hard clinical outcomes. And now I think that's really nice to see that that has in fact changed. In fact, it's gone from a modality with relatively minimal, minimal evidence to now a modality that has multiple randomized clinical trials. In fact, this, this number actually, I should actually update this slide. It actually changes um, you know, about every six months, we see a new comparative effectiveness trials, both in the stable and acute chest pain populations. And so this has gone to be one of the most robustly studied uh, modalities when you think of how many randomized clinical trials that this modality has, 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 has had amongst these different patient populations. And so really, uh, if you look at, you know, the first question you often have for some of the general fellows and those in the audience is, you know, what are the strengths and what are the limitations of this modality? Because no modality is, um, is, 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 is perfect or, or, or can say that they're better than another modality. It's about how you use this modality in patients. And what we know that the strength of coronary CT, whether you compare it to, an, to a gold standard of an, a calf, uh, an angiographic stenosis greater than 50%, so potentially, potentially flow limiting stenosis, if that's your goal, then it, it's strength is sensitivity, per patient sensitivity of over 95%. With a modest specificity, what we typically see is that stenosis in that intermediate range, if we say it's, you know, 60% stenosis in the, on CTA, then it may be a 50 or 49% stenosis in the cath lab. We see those discrepancies, particularly around the intermediate lesions. If you use invasive FFR as your gold standard to define functionally significant coronary disease, again, the strength of CT is its per patient sensitivity of over 90%, using a stenosis threshold of less than 50%. So you're rarely missing flow limiting stenosis when you use that cut off and I think compares relatively well with other modalities. But again, you can see um, fairly low specificity and that should not surprise you. We know that invasive angiography, just looking at a lesion and saying, you know, is this going to be functionally significant if we're going to use invasive FFR? Now we, we can talk a lot about whether, you know, we should be using invasive FFR quite frankly. Um, but we know that it's probably better than just using our eyes alone uh, to make decisions about revascularization. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, the technology has changed, fortunately. The scan times have gotten so much shorter. The volume of, 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 of anatomy that we can acquire is much uh, larger and the rotation times are better. And so the contrast doses that we're using now are typically under 60 cc's of contrast uh, intravenously, which is associated with, with virtually um, you know, less than 1% rate of contrast-induced nephropathy. And for outpatients, it's closer to 0%. And of course, we've seen technology. This is one of the technologies we use here at UVA and, and around the world. It's high pitch helical acquisition, not available in all patients, but for slow, stable heart rates, we can now do coronary CT angiography down less than one millisievert um, and get highly diagnostic images. And so this is not something we can always use, but we frequently use here at, in, in, our, in our lab. And we've seen that across the world, if you look at protection six, the radiation doses um, have come down dramatically, nearly 80%. Um, we were uh, a site for this at Walter Reed, and 
there's some, certainly some expert center bias built into this um, survey with, with particularly it only surveyed less than six, less than 65 sites, but it, suffice it to say, and I think you all are aware at your own site that the radiation doses are now much more acceptable. And um, this is really kudos to a lot of investigators around the world and, and the, um, and the uh, CT manufacturers. So going back in time, you know, we were, uh, we, you know, the first question was, what are the prognostic significance of coronary CT? And we didn't know this back when we designed the, the confirmed registry. And this is a registry that was led by Jim Min and so many others around the world. And we literally pulled data and said, you know, what, 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 does, the, what does it mean when we see plaque? Obviously obstructive disease, but what about these patients, which are a large proportion of any CT lab and confirm it was over a third of patients who had non-obstructive plaque and what we saw was that much like invasive angiography, the more atherosclerosis you have, the worse you do, whether you look at for, for almost any endpoint, whether you look at all-cause mortality, whether you look at cardiovascular uh, endpoints such as MI, people do worse the more atherosclerosis they have, even when it's angiographically insignificant. And so one of the concepts we, we've learned is that the absence of atherosclerosis, you've heard a lot about the power of zero perhaps, but I think the real power of zero um, relative to calcium scoring is a normal, truly normal coronary CT angiography. And we know that that is powerful clinically. And that, in fact, I had this discussion with a patient yesterday in clinic who had an entirely normal CT and a 74 year old woman who had recurrent ED presentations. Um, um, and, 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 and we can talk a little bit more about this, this population in general, but what we know is that the absence of atherosclerosis, if you look across event rates from CONFIRM and other long-term follow-up studies are, are, are about as low as you can get. In fact, if you look at a meta-analytic standpoint, the absence of any atherosclerosis have, has about the most powerful negative predictive uh, power, if you will, of any test that we have because of its ability to see subclinical atherosclerosis. And so if you think about how did this translate in some of these comparative effectiveness trials? Well, we know that in Scott Hart, the tests don't change outcomes unless they're paired with changes in management. Um, and so um, what we know in Scott Hart is that as patients saw atherosclerosis, they were treated differently. They were treated significantly differently with relative, relative to preventive therapies. Um, and we don't know how they behave differently, whether they adopted healthier lifestyles. But what we do know there is there is about a 40% reduction in MI and coronary heart disease death over five years once people acted on this, these findings that they saw on CT. And this was true in large scale registries. And we know from a meta analytica standpoint that when you pair atherosclerosis imaging with better prevention, predominantly in patients who do not need stents, who don't need to go to the cath lab, but who may not have been aware of their risk or may not have been a, even willing to take preventive therapies that we can move the needle with, re, with regards to reducing incident MI rates. And I think this is an outcome that you know, patients care about. Um, and this was of course seen in the Scott Hart trial, I won't belabor this, but we saw this 40% increase in preventive therapies. And this was really, not, not, not something that was mandated by the investigators. This was observational uh, as people went back after their testing to uh, meet with their care team. Um, and so I think one of the advantages are, that, that I've already kind of hinted on already is uh, of CT is this ability to look at a wide spectrum of coronary disease. I'm gonna come back to this concept in a second is that most events that we've seen in these comparative effectiveness trials who have undergone functional testing have actually occurred in patients with normal studies. And that's a tough conversation to have. You know, I had a patient last week who said I had a normal stress test two years ago and I had this huge anterior MI. Um, and, you know, we all know why that can occur pathophysiologically, but this person was certainly not on preventive therapies. Um, and so I think this goes back to this ability to see not just angiographically significant disease, but all degrees of coronary artery disease. And so if we look at within the PROMISE trial, for example, and who had events, for example, who had death, MI, or uh, admissions for unstable angina, the majority of events actually occurred in patients who had, um, who had uh, uh, actually a normal stress test. And so you can see that the positive functional test identified a minority of patients who ended up having 
a disease. In fact, again, stated another way, the majority of events occurred in patients with, with completely normal functional tests with the follow-up duration in this trial under two years. So these were relatively early events after being told you have a normal stress test. And then that was not the case with coronary CT. And I go back to the paradigm that atherosclerosis, the burden of atherosclerosis is prognostically probably one of the more powerful things that we have in medicine. And of course, the majority of events occurred in patients who had atherosclerosis and, a, and less than 9% of patients who had events had a normal CT. And so this kind of brings us back to uh, you know, targeting, targeting prevention, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And I go back to the comment that you can't treat what you don't see. And in many patients, they may already be on treatment. And so maybe anatomic imaging won't be helpful. But in many patients, they're either not on preventive therapy, they're not on optimal preventive therapy, or they're not willing to take preventive therapy. And in many patients, perhaps their care team or the patient would be more willing to do so with atherosclerosis imaging. And so from a, from a clinician and preventive standpoint, and we'll come back to how the guidelines incorporated this, if there is a need to understand or know, does someone have atherosclerosis, coronary atherosclerosis? Um, then perhaps anatomic imaging may be favored. And I think one of the advantages is that we can look across a broad spectrum of patients. For example, a patient with chest pain, um, diffuse non-obstructive disease, this patient with chest pain, with diffuse non-obstructive disease, perhaps with potential high-risk plaque features, whereas this patient totally normal coronary CT, all of them, we would expect to have normal functional testing, um, provided they don't have microvascular disease. Um, but I would argue that these patients might be treated differently and certainly we'd know on basis of data that they have a different prognosis. Now, how does this play out from a cost perspective? And we've had this discussion with payers a lot. Um, and many of you probably have spent some time doing prior authorizations with people. Um, and, and is this strategy a smart strategy, um, you know, doing anatomic imaging? Um, and the folks from the PROMISE study attempted to model this. As you know, it was a fairly, relatively short-term study. The event rates were relatively low. Um, and, but they said, okay, well, let's take some, make some assumptions um, based on cath rates that we observed during the two years. Let's extrapolate that out to five years. Um, and um, let's look at, you know, who went to the cath lab and had a normal cath versus who did not. And, um, and we can do some cost assessments based also on the implementation of preventive therapies. And let's model that over the lifetime of this large population. Um, and, you know, what do we find? And so what they found was that, in fact, if you model this and you make some assumptions about event reduction and differences in preventive therapies, um, what they found is that an anatomic strategy was less costly and more effective for improving outcomes in this modeling exercise. Um, and you can see a quote from the conclusions here is that this was mainly driven, not so much by the test that you did, but just by the detection of non-obstructive disease and an ability to tailor preventive therapies. And I mentioned this because I think traditionally we've simplified preventive therapies. We've said, okay, if you have coronary calcium or you have plaque, maybe we'll put you on a statin. Maybe if you have a lot of it, we'll put you on an aspirin, but that's kind of all we have. And I think that day has changed. And I think with the uh, development of uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists and you know, the whole armamentarium, SGLT2 inhibitors, these advances in lipid non-statin therapies, which right now are pretty costly and may not be cost effective, but I think those days are evolving. And I think prevention is now expanding much beyond the decision of yes or no statin. And I think this is another, I think, um, you know, area where anatomic imaging may certainly help us. Now, there may be some differences by age, and this is a sub-study uh, from the PROMISE uh, group that looked at how do these tests perform based on age. Now, the majority of patients in PROMISE were under 65, 71%. Um, but they looked at the relationship of test positivity to outcomes. And test positivity for CT was 70% you know, stenosis in an epicardial vessel, or at least 50% in the left main, when a nuclear test was, a, was an abnormality in at least one vessel territory. And what they found if you were under 65, functional tests were not associated with outcomes, whereas uh, CTA findings of having an abnormal CTA or having coordinated calcium greater than 100 were strongly predictive of outcomes. Uh, if you were under 65, again, no difference in stress testing. And the majority of these tests were normal. The functional tests in these patients were normal. If you were over 65, functional tests were more predictive. And most of these people had atherosclerosis. Um, and so the conclusions, which were hypothesis generating, but ended up in our guidelines were 
that CTA would be the test of choice for our younger population. And that functional testing, particularly in older men, would be preferred in the over 65 population. Now, I'm gonna, the last comment I'm going to make before we kind of go through the, uh, some of the new changes in the guidelines are how we have historically selected people for the cath lab. We've not done a very good job. And you can argue that now with the ischemia trial, perhaps we should change this even further. What we do know is that historically, when you look at large registries, whether you look at the VA or the NCDR, that using functional testing in patients without known disease, it's about a 50% rate of actually finding angiographically significant stenosis. We have a lot of normal catheterizations. Um, and that, of course, when you use an anatomic test to select people, that rate goes down. We, rare, we rarely send people to the cath lab from the CT lab and, and find out they have normal coronaries. And so that's something that I think this gatekeeper role to the cath lab has been, I think, something that many of us use clinically. Now, this was tested in the CONSERVE trial. I was an investigator with this trial. Um, and we took people who were already scheduled for, to go to the cath lab. These were people on the cath lab schedule who were non-ACS patients who had stable, stable symptoms. And we said, let's just do a CT. And if you have less than 50% stenosis, let's recommend to your doctors that you not go to the cath lab. Um, you could still go. It was up to the investigator or up to the, the managing treatment team and the patient, of course. Um, but in, it turns out you could cancel about 80% of these casts. Uh, and many of these patients did not have significant coronary disease, at least epicardial coronary disease that you could treat in the cath lab. And this was safe and seemed to, uh, at least for you know, relatively short follow-up period, seemed to be safe. And the cost went down dramatically when you, when you, when you canceled nearly 80% of the cath that you perform. And so this is something that, again, when we go through the guidelines, I think is some data that was taken into account. Now, the last study I want to just talk about as we look into the 2021 guidelines is, um, is the Credence trial. And this was a trial that many of you are probably aware of. It's unique in the sense that it was a large population with stable symptoms. And they underwent, all patients underwent a three-vessel invasive FFR. They went a, underwent a coronary CT. They used FFR CT. And then they all went some form of stress testing, 78% uh, respect. And the minority of these patients were, were tested using PET. For CMR. And the gold standard here, the outcome was detection of invasive FFR or functionally significant coronary disease in the cath lab. And I have some reservations about this and we'll come back to this, but the question was which technology can, can, can detect this in a more accurate way. Um, and, 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 and not just looking at stenosis. So for example, for CT, they looked at stenosis, but they also quantified plaque volume and looked at high-risk plaque features. For stress imaging, they didn't just look at the typical features you might think of as, is there a scheme or not? But they also included exercise parameters, EF, and various different measures of the degree of ischemia. Um, and they, within this population, uh, derived and validated uh, within different cohorts. Um, and what they found is that, in fact, if you use an anatomic approach that doesn't just include stenosis severity, um, if you used to notice the severity did very well, but um, if you included a lot of the other features that we see in CT, such as the number of lesions with high-risk plaque, um, the percent of non-calcified plaque volume, you can see that compared to stress MPI, again, the majority of respect, we saw a superior ability to detect lesions in the cath lab with a low FFR. Um, and, and I think this was something that um, I'll come back to in a, in, in a moment. What was interesting, if you look, you look at just stenosis alone, it did pretty well. And there are a lot of stenosis bashers out there in the CT world. And, and, um, and it's an imperfect, as you know, an imperfect measure of coronary disease. But the absence of stenosis does, did, does pretty well at excluding um, likelihood to have an, an abnormal FFR in the cath lab. Um, it could be improved if you added in atherosclerotic plaques. So you can see that your overall accuracy improved for plaque quantification. And I'm showing you this as kind of a teaser to where the field of CT is moving. There is now a race to how to best define plaque. How do we quantify it? How do we normalize it with regards to vessel length or vessel size or gender and age and things like that? And there are you know, a lot of different software, and that's really a whole talk in and of itself. It's something I'm interested in. Um, and, and that's really where the field is moving. And this was done all essentially manually um, uh, using some fairly rudimentary software. And I think the software has certainly advanced. Um, and you can see by adding FFRCT, you really didn't move the needle to improving your accuracy. If you could quantify plaque, maybe a slight improvement 
particularly with specificity over stenosis alone. And so, the, so, so bringing this kind of full circle to the ischemia trial, and, and I'm going to mention the ischemia trial because it, it, it was not a trial, not a CT trial, it was not a trial that you could, wasn't even designed to compare imaging modalities, but it's caused a lot of interest in this concept of anatomic imaging and changing our referral patterns to who we're sending to the cath lab. Um, and, and the reason it became interesting from a CT trial is, as you know, this was a, a trial designed to test an initial invasive versus conservative strategy in patients who had at least moderate or severe ischemia on functional testing. And about half of these patients were, were, were nuclear imaging, um, but there was a heterogeneous functional testing arm um, and you, you, of course, all know the results of this and that there was no, no difference. There was perhaps some angina symptom relief, particularly in patients who had high levels of angina baseline. And despite, in some cases, despite medical therapy. But the reason it became interesting is because of the design of the trial. And in, in, to ensure that patients actually had coronary disease, people got a coronary CT. This was also done to rule out left main coronary disease. And this was done in around 80% of patients. And so it allowed us the ability to say, well, gosh, let's look at if these patients had both a functional test and a coronary CT test, this is a much higher risk population than most of us are used to testing and one in five of them had a prior MI. Um, but the concept of being, you know, you know, taking patients and saying, you know, we don't have to cath everybody, perhaps just ruling out high risk coronary disease and using aggressive medical therapy might be a reasonable treatment approach. And so maybe in this trial CT or, or, or functional testing, would be a reasonable uh, strategy to do that. Well, I think one of the advantages that we, we saw within this trial was that using anatomic imaging, we found that from, um, if you look within the trial, upfront CT, about one fifth of patients who had moderate to severe ischemia had no significant coronary disease. Um, and probably should, don't need to go to the cath lab at all. There's, there's nothing to fix. Well, you could certainly argue to treat their microvascular disease and treat their risk factors. And, and of course, it, within this population, they had a lot of atherosclerosis. But we found that using functional testing as a gatekeeper to the cath lab was probably not a great treatment strategy. Um, and, and so that's something that while this wasn't compared, I think it was an important observation when one in five of the patients referred to the cath lab or referred for enrollment in the trial were actually not even included in the trial based on the absence of significant coronary disease. And so I think really an important observation, particularly when you look at a sub-study from ischemia showing that CT and cath correlated very high and that you rarely miss clinically relevant disease, whether it be left main disease or high risk three vessel disease. And so this raised a, certainly a, a group of, of clinicians who said, well, gosh, you know, you know, even in high risk patients, perhaps my treatment, you know, my, my management strategy is let me rule out high risk disease. Let me rule out left main disease, which we know is often even hard to detect in functional testing and treat the rest medically. Uh, and, and certainly from this trial in patients not having severe angina who are stable would be a relevant a reasonable approach. And I think this serves as kind of a background for some of our guidelines. And so where are we? Well, the guidelines have evolved and this is, a, this is from the UK and they were probably ahead of the curve a little bit. This was published in 2016. This is the nice CG95 um, national practice standard put out uh, by the NHS. And they really were very, um, you know, very unique in 2016. Um, they said that if you have uh, chest pain, and you don't have known coronary disease. If you have typical or what they define as atypical angina, the, and we can come back to those terms, that you should go directly to coronary CT, with the caveat being that you could exclude high-risk coronary disease in most patients and move on with, um, with managing these patients. It would be an efficient way of doing business. Um, we, this was followed in 2019 by the uh, ESC Chronic Coronary Syndrome Guideline. Um, which stated that coronary CT is the preferred test in patients with a lower range of clinical likelihood of coronary disease, no prior diagnosis of coronary disease, and you had access to high quality imaging. And, in, and they, as you know, revised the pretest probability tables and such that really only men over 70 would have um, high risk or high pretest probability. So it became really a, 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 a class one recommendation for the first time in an international guideline amongst patients without known uh, coronary disease. And so this was a real big, uh, real big change as a backdrop. 
They also included this concept of using CT as a gatekeeper. So if you've had equivocal or non-diagnostic functional testing, rather than reflexively referring someone to the cath lab, consider doing a coronary CT. And I showed you some of the literature behind that. So where are we with this current guideline? Well, I think, you know, you've all probably seen this image, the concept being that not everybody needs testing. And I think this is a real important one that you can defer testing in many of our lower risk patients. We probably over test a large proportion of our population, whether this be for acute chest pain or stable chest pain. Uh, and that we reserve testing, whether it be anatomic or functional for our intermediate and high risk patients, at least those who do not in the ACS population need to go directly to the cath lab. And so one of the changes that I think affects CT is the inclusion of coronary calcium. Um, these are really revised pretest probability tables that were adopted from the ESC. But one of the things that you'll see is that in fact, if you understand, you know, if someone's had some assessment of their coronary calcium burden, if they have any coronary calcium, they would immediately shift to a greater than 15% pretest probability into a probable test probability. So that was one of the changes. And I think one of the things the, gui the guideline writers highlighted was the use of prior imaging to refine management. In fact, if you look at the algorithms, one of the first things you should do is look at prior imaging. So this includes non-gated chest CTs. And of course, in you know, patients that have this degree of calcium burden, we would recommend functional testing. Or if someone's had an equivocal stress test in the past, perhaps uh, as long as they're coming back with non-high risk a, uh, presentations, we would recommend anatomic imaging. And these were recommendations that were taken up in the guideline. So what does the guideline show? Well, if you're less than 15% pretest probability, generally no testing. You can consider coronary calcium or exercise ECG testing, but um, the recommendation was that in low risk populations, most of these patients at least don't need initial testing. Now, the caveat I would add to this is that this has never been tested. Uh, there is no randomized clinical trial that I'm aware of that has actually tested this strategy. What's interesting, I was talking to Pam Douglas, is that this would actually do no testing in about 40% at least of the promise patients. And so many of the trials that we've talked about um, already, many of those patients under the current guideline would actually be recommended to have no testing at all, which may be very reasonable given the low event rates, but that is something that has a big shift. Uh, in fact, this is a big shift from the ESC guidelines who do recommend that you can do testing between five uh, and 15% in select patients, particularly if you know they have, for example, coronary calcium or have had prior chest imaging that suggests they have atherosclerosis. So this is a really big change. Uh, again, not necessarily proven by prospective randomized trials based more on expert opinion and based on the fact that the event rates in these populations were very low and not shown to be moved, it necessarily improved by testing to date. Well, this is where what we're talking about. These are the patients that we all address uh, and the guidelines address as intermediate to high risk. And they lump them all together. These are patients who are greater than 15% pretest probability. And you've all probably seen this chart. Where does CT have a role? Well, I think I mentioned the patient earlier. If there is a clinical um, goal to not only rule out high risk coronary disease, but also to detect non-obstructive disease in patients in whom it would change your preventive strategy. Obviously you need access to high quality imaging. And while not a guideline recommendation, the, the authors felt that it was reasonable guidance to consider preferring CT in those under 65 as composed to those at least 65 years of age. I mentioned already the prior functional study inconclusive, repeating that same study again and expecting a different result, probably not a good strategy. Um, and you would consider CT if there was an other anatomic questions that you could answer by doing that exam. Um, for example, if you needed to visualize an aorta that was enlarged on a chest x-ray or or there was some other anatomic reason to do CT. Um, and then, you know, of course, the, the reasons to do functional testing, um, I mentioned the age, if someone's had a prior inconclusive or indeterminate stenosis on CT, or if you think about your cardiomyopathic patients where there's an, in, you know, a need to um, assess them with the MRI, assess their scar burden, maybe rule out other non-ischemic causes for their disease, or if you suspect coronary microvascular dysfunction, if you have PET um, or in some areas MR, and of course, you're aware that exercise ECG is class 2A and not the preferred testing strategy any longer and would only be considered in patients with an interpretable EKG and a reasonable exercise capacity estimated to be over five METs. Now, what do you do after you've done a CT? And this is, there's been a lot of controversy. We know that I mentioned already, if you have no plaque, I think you can, you can really reassure these patients that they probably don't even have microvascular disease and they are going to do exceptionally well. 
and you can, I think, consider non-atherosclerotic causes. Um, if they have obstructive disease, you can see that the guideline writers don't say rush them to the cath lab. Um, and you know, that you can consider functional testing, um, or I would even argue, just consider medical therapy. Um, and if, um, particularly if there's, uh, again, non-left main disease, um, and the patient is not having high risk angina. And in fact, the guideline writer, writers say, you know, if you have frequent angina, only then would you consider going to the cath lab or if you had high risk functional testing um, uh, results. Uh, again, they consider use of, of a technology called FFRCT or, or stress testing in this population. But I would argue having the courage to say, you've had an angiogram, you don't have high risk coronary disease, let's try my, uh, medical therapy. But the guideline writers defining here med high risk coronary disease as left main greater than 50% or three vessel stenosis greater than 70%. Now, if you're undergoing functional testing, this is I think an important recommendation I do. I spend a lot of time in our nuclear lab, but that if you can add coronary calcium testing, this is recommended, it can be useful. And I think from a practical standpoint, you all are aware of this, it can help you interpret artifacts, I think with more confidence. Um, it um, adds to the prognostic benefit that you can get from functional testing where you can combine both the ischemia testing as well as a measure of overall atherosclerotic burden. And so this was, I think, an important recommendation. If you have known disease, again, avoid a reflexive testing and intensify medical therapy. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these patients, but I think this is the group where functional testing really should be preferred, even though they were both given anatomic imaging, were given similar recommendations. I think that is um, where most of us would prefer using functional testing. What about in a chest, in acute chest pain? Well, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, as you know, there's multiple randomized clinical trials that have looked at this. We did a meta-analysis years ago showing that you can really get people out of the hospital faster. You can perhaps um, save some money if you were in a, in, a, in a healthcare system where you were admitting these patients or keeping them for 24 hours. Um, but you, know, you end up cathing about 2% more people because you see a lot of intermediate stenosis. Well, in a high sensitivity troponin era, where does CT work? We know that many of these patients using standard clinical decision pathways and high sensitivity troponins do not need any testing. And so what we saw is that CT performs well, it mainly helps you um, by, you know, essentially, if you compare it to high sensitivity troponins, you, you get an answer in the emergency room and you don't have to do a follow-up visit, but was really not much better than high sensitivity troponins at excluding disease. And so the use of CT has now shifted in the ED um, to not being used in these low risk negative troponin patients, but more so in patients who have equivocal troponins or who have uh, some concern for ACS despite the clinical decision pathway. Uh, and that's what's now reflected in guidelines. And so the 2020 guidelines, again, class one recommendation for CT to exclude ACS if there's a low to intermediate likelihood of coronary disease when troponins or ECGs are normal or inconclusive, the people you don't feel comfortable sending home, or in people who you're considering going to the cath lab, but it's just not clear as to whether this is ACS or some other type of injury, myocardial injury. Um, and so this, this is really uh, something international guidelines have now adopted. And that's what we've seen in the, in the uh, US guidelines, where again, anatomic or functional testing was reserved for the intermediate risk patients. And again, the first question is, have they had prior testing? And if they've not, then you can choose. And I think this gives us all a lot of leeway. We know that there is no uh, right test for each individual, but I think using those caveats on who are good CT candidates is, is important based on prior testing results and based on what we know about that patient. Uh, do we know their atherosclerotic burden? If they've had prior testing and certainly looking at that and then using that, um, as we've already discussed, to guide our testing strategy. For example, if you've had a totally normal CT within two years, I would argue this should be about five years, but um, you know, that's somebody who probably doesn't need testing uh, at all. And so this is kind of, I think now, if you look at kind of what the guideline writers have put out, and this is uh, something we're putting together within an expert decision pathway for the ACS, is that you know, what favors CT versus favors stress testing. A lot of the stuff we've already talked about with regards to anatomic disease burden, results of prior tests, and your ability to get high quality imaging. And so a lot, a lot has gone into how to manage these results. I'm not gonna go through this, this is very busy, but the comment being that non-obstructive disease matters. And so you have to, all of us now, have to have pathways to address if we're doing CT in our chest pain units to not only address 
you know, do they have high risk stenosis suggestive of ACS, but do they have non-obstructive disease that's unlikely related to their symptoms that needs to be followed up and treated? And I think that's something that I think uh, uh, we're all going to be challenged to do. So I'm going to close uh, here talking a little bit about training and some unique feature or some unique populations where I think it's, you know, our testing strategies that we have been doing for the last, you know, four or five decades have got to start evolving. And one of those is, 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 is in women and testing uh, in women. We know that if you look at the NCDR registry, the most, the strongest predictor of having a normal calf is being a woman. Most of these patients had functional testing. Um, and the question is, can, you know, can we avoid this scenario where we send people to the cath lab and say your, your, your coronary arteries are normal? Um, can we better select people for revascularization and invasive procedures and perhaps improve outcomes by, you know, treating patients in a, in a more, I think, a more preventive focused way and less, and less so in an angiographic stenosis focused way? And we had some signals from Promise is that in women, a positive CT was much more predictive of events as, a negative, as compared to a negative CT. So the presence of atherosclerosis in women was significantly um, prognostically more powerful than having an abnormal stress test. In fact, abnormal stress tests in women in this trial were not predictive of events. Um, and as compared to men, where CT was less predictive and functional tests were more um, predictive of outcomes. Uh, and so this concept that any atherosclerosis in women is a marker of increased events, um, particularly in younger women or, in, or, or middle-aged women, um, is I think a concept that's been seen not just within PROMISE. And so the impact of non-obstructive non disease in women seems to be prognostically quite uh, important, while less common, uh, clinically important. And within Romicat 2, it was actually women because they had less calcium. They were much more likely to have a normal CT. It was women who were able to be discharged much earlier following a CT compared to standard of care, um, where there was no difference in men in Romicat 2. And so this concept that, um, you know, in women, anatomic imaging may be a real value if you can do it with very low radiation doses and at high quality. What we do know, whether you look across confirm, whether you look across invasive angiography registries, or you look across large scale um, anatomic studies is that women are much less likely to have obstructive disease. They're much less likely to have calcified atherosclerosis and much more likely if they do have atherosclerosis that that atherosclerosis be diffuse and not obstructive. Um, and so this is something that we're studying in the warrior trial um, is you know, can you, this atherosclerosis that we see on a cath or, an, or, or CTA, um, if we change our management after seeing that, can we improve outcomes? And this is something that's being studied now uh, in, this, in this trial. And I, I look forward to the outcomes of this and testing that strategy. But I think in the meantime, you know, I think the, the onus um, and, and the importance, you know, we know that women are often not uh, as aggressively managed from a preventive therapy. And they also often have this concept of ischemia without obstructive disease that all, all of you are aware of. And I think CT has a really important role. And I think there's an advantage to starting with upfront CT imaging instead of going backwards. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think if you look at the EAPCI diagnostic criteria for microvascular angina or microvascular disease, obviously you have to have symptoms that are consistent with angina, right? Um, it's not chest wall pain, not funny non-anginal chest pain, it has to be angina. And you have to have excluded obstructive coronary disease and either by invasive angiography or CT. And so starting with CT imaging up front, you get this question right away, is do I have obstructive coronary disease? I don't have to take a functional test and go backwards in the sense. Um, and we know that microvascular disease is very unlikely in the absence of atherosclerosis. And so having a totally normal CT is very helpful as you contemplate, should I do other testing for microvascular disease? And so I think this testing paradigm where we've traditionally started with tests like stress echo or spec, I think we have better functional tests today. And I think when you compare using anatomic imaging, particularly in women or concern, if there's a concern for microvascular disease, assessing is there high risk coronary disease if there's not, I probably don't need to cat that person. Is there, a, is there extensive non-atherosclerotic plaque that I need to address preventively? And if they're still having angina, perhaps test for microvascular disease, if it will change your treatment management is a new paradigm that I think um, using anatomic imaging first allows us to do quite easily. Um, and in fact, the guideline writers addressed this and they said, if you have stable chest pain, suspected ischemia, and 
non-obstructive coronary disease. Again, a prerequisite for the diagnosis of Anoka and the advantage of anatomic imaging up front. Then you should consider testing for this with stress PET, which is most commonly used and maybe, um, and, and maybe stress uh, CMR. And then consider treating these patients um, appropriately based on these results. And I think we just simply have better functional tests today. And I mentioned two of them being stress PET and stress CMR. Um, now the problem with CTA is you could argue it's quite a bargain in the sense that it is uh, um, from a reimbursement standpoint, not super well reimbursed. If maybe that's value-based imaging, I think it's certainly precluded its ability to be, um, you know, people build uh, their CT programs. Um, and we can certainly talk about why that is. But I think, I think 2021 going forward is a time for real change. And I think we have to move from, this is a slide from Jim Min that I really like, in that you know, anatomic imaging, it is atherosclerosis that is the primary disease process. And we, for the last 40 years, have seen patients in the clinic or we've seen them in the, acute, in, in the ED. And we initially say, not only you know, do you have atherosclerosis or stenosis, we, we say, do you have ischemia, which is really a tertiary physiologic consequence of advanced coronary disease. Um, and steno or we focused on stenosis, which is really an anatomic threshold, um, arbitrary cut point that we have created, that we've said that's too much luminal narrowing, we need to do something about it, when it's really the amount of plaque that really tends to predict prognosis. And so we've generally asked all the right questions in, in exactly the wrong order. All of these things are important. All of them are important. But if you look at the prevalence of advanced disease, the prevalence of ischemia relative to atherosclerosis that will change management. I think starting with atherosclerosis first, do you have atherosclerosis at all? And if so, how much? And if you have a really whole bunch, maybe we'll go to the cath lab, but most of you can probably do well with medical therapy. It's probably a good treatment paradigm. Now, I, I kind of bash on spec a little bit. I do spec, I spend a lot of time in the nuclear lab, but I think we have better functional tests. And I'm a big fan of functional testing. We do a ton of stress CMR and a ton of PET. We should be doing more. And if you look, for example, in a meta-analysis that uses invasive FFR as the endpoint, the sensitivity of SPECT in this example was 57%. Um, and has reasonable specificity. But the problem when you talk to patients is about missed disease. And so if you think, if you actually do the math with this number and, and look at the math of sensitivity of 57%, for every single patient you identify as positive correctly, you misclassify a patient who has a normal functional SPECT as, as, as who, who actually has invasive disease, you misclassify them as, as being negative. And so it's a flip of a coin with regards to your ability to detect invasive FFR abnormalities. Now, maybe that's not the best gold standard. I don't think it is. But when you're, if, you, if that is your goal to detect potential flow limiting coronary disease, it's a, it, it oftentimes, I think, um, is fairly specific, but lacks the sensitivity that most patients would demand in, in, in today. And I think the guideline writers got this right is they said now PET is formally favored over SPEC for intermediate high-risk patients um, and no known coronary disease. If you're going to do nuclear MI, PET is, is a reasonable preference. And this is a direct quote from the guidelines with regards to the radiation exposure between these two technologies. So I think the time has come that we, we really change our paradigm. And this is some work by David, um, her at your institution and Lauren Baldessari and others that have really said, okay, maybe these, have, maybe these guidelines and these, this, this, this evolution of these technologies should change how we train cardiology fellows. And this is just a survey from your institution showing that there is, a, a, I think, a, a, an interest in more education and more training uh, opportunities. And I was talking with Lauren before we started that you know, we have really changed our training paradigm for our general cardiology fellows and now offer cardiac CT training. I mean, think about how much of your curriculum is dedicated to stress echocardiography and SPEC and invasive angiography. And we see that so many fellows, when they go out and are now interviewing, they're being asked, do you do PET? Do you do coronary CT? And I think the guidelines would suggest we should probably shift our training focus in our radiology residencies. Um, we need more CT imagers. We certainly need more cardiologists involved in this. We need the field to grow so that we can actually meet the, the potential of this, uh, of this new guideline um, and where you know, we, we give patients options um, and so there's no one size fits all strategy uh, anymore. And I think appropriately selecting these different tests based on how, not only is it gonna change our decision-making uh, with regards to, 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 to ischemia medicines or do you need to go to the cath lab, but also our decision-making on prevention. And so I think the new guidelines writers, despite some of the controversy, I think a lot of things they got right. 
They had a focus on prevention. They tried to you know, keep us from the reflexive referral to the cath lab. They reminded us to understand not only who's sitting in front of us with regards to risk factors and symptoms, but also what, have they, what testing have they had done before? So I would challenge all of you to look at these prior non-gated CTs, look at these prior tests. It really should drive a lot of your decision-making. And in fact, I, make the, I tell my fellows every day that any CT imaging that has included the heart is a prior cardiac test. And you should look at it, you should report it and discuss it. And how does it Im impact your prevention and which test you choose? I think this is an important advancement for coronary CT. I think it matches the level of randomized cl clinical trial evidence and is the only test given a level of evidence a class one recommendation is now first line testing, not for every patient, but for a lot of patients where anatomic imaging is un or an, an anatomic presence of atherosclerosis is unknown and patients who do not have known or diffuse non-obstructive or obstructive coronary disease is a good test. And I think functional testing is cemented as a foundational test, particularly in patients who are older, who, who have like extensive atherosclerosis or known disease. And if you know, they changed the diagnosis or changed the criteria for what is known disease to include non-obstructive disease. And so we'll see how that plays out and how we discuss our findings with patients. Um, and I think the value of CT is the A, the atherosclerosis. It is the A in ASCV risk. And I think I've mentioned already the prognostic uh, and cost, I think the advantages of using this and also using this as a gatekeeper role. So with that, that I'll stop and take questions. I know it was, it was a lot that we covered. Hopefully we have some uh, time for questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Todd. That was, as usual, an amazing talk. Uh, we really appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Uh, we have a few minutes. I'm sure we have some questions, so we'll open it up. People can either unmute and ask a question or you can put it in the chat and I'll, I'll read it for you. Okay. Uh, Hi, Lauren. It's, it's okay. Um, I can go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, Todd. Uh, great to see you. And uh, thanks for, uh, I think, for, for congratulations on presenting such a balanced approach of, uh, to the review of the guidelines. And uh, just, it, you know, as full disclosure, Todd and I, I think, have been having this debate for 13 years or so. And so it's nice to see it continuing and, and a wonderful, uh, I think, reflection of the nuance of how we should approach these patients. So my, my question for you, Todd, is um, as we as as we combine multimodality imaging, and you know you, you rightly define and reflect the paradigm of uh, under, understanding atherosclerotic burden. Do you think it's possible to show superiority of anatomic versus functional testing strategies if we include um, you know CT calcium scores or non-invasive evaluation of of uh, calcifications as part of both studies, meaning, you know, if you have spec CT, if you have coronary calcification as part of your CTA, does the atherosclerotic burden that one gets from the, or the, the assessment of the, the likelihood of functional stenosis one gets from the contrast or even the, the functional characteristics, you think that's gonna be able to show superior, would we be able to show superiority of anatomic versus functional testing if we included all those variables together? Well, it's a great, I, I, I'm a big believer in reporting, um, you know, calcium scoring, if you have the ability to do so in, you know, in your specter pet labs, I, I think it's a, a really important, uh, it's a number that patients tend to, you know, it's been around long enough. I think primary care providers understand the scores. Um, I think it's very, very, very important to do that. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, I think it would take clinical trials to decide whether, you know, if you combine calcium scoring plus plus uh, functional testing as, you know, do, do, are you as good? I think you're going to be pretty similar. I mean, I think that, you know, again, the atherosclerotic burden on calcium scoring does pretty well. Now, if you look at um, what we know, and this is just a slide I, I just put up from Promise, and this is not really the purpose of this slide, but it does show us that the findings on CT are better than calcium scoring uh, within um, both acute and, 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 and chronic chest pain populations. So if you look in Promise and you look in Romicad and others studies, that the ability of CT angiography to see stenosis, to see uh, high-risk plaque features, to see non-calcified plaque, and particularly in an era where we're moving towards plaque quantification, it is better than calcium scoring um, by a little bit. 
but it's not by a lot. And so I think, um, you know, whether, whether, whether CT would be better or not, I think remains to be seen. But I, I mean, I do think that, yes, there are advantages of CT and geography. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I think if you combine that with functional imaging, that's a really powerful uh, op option for many patients. Um, so, um, you know, I think you can, you know, there's certainly advantages to sometimes knowing is there stenosis or is there, is there um, you know, left main disease, for example, is a population that you could certainly miss in that uh, functional testing strategy. But I, I think it's a, a valid question. It's something we, we talk about. Um, and I think, you know, you know, as a reader in, the, in our nuclear lab, knowing atherosclerotic burden is very helpful, as you know, you know, for deciphering artifacts, you know, borderline TID. They don't have three vessel disease if they don't have coronary calcium, right? So um, I think it's, it's helpful for a lot of other reasons, too. Great. Uh, we have a few questions uh, and, and one comment from Margaret Furman. Great talk. Thank you. Um, and then there's three questions here. We're at the hour, but um, if it's okay with you, yeah. Todd, if you have time, just for people who have time to yep. stay on, we'll, we'll go through these. Um, so the first question is from um, Art Seltzer. Those of us with a focus on echocardiography use stress echo as an excellent low cost, no radiation test with good specificity to exclude high risk ischemia. Also, it is a useful test to look at ischemia distant from an infarct zone. Yeah, no, I think stress echo is not going away. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, the, you know I, I do a lot of stress echo. I, I, I think the, um, you, you know, I think it's really probably it's evolving role is probably in those with known coronary disease. Um, I mean, I think the problem we saw in, 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 in the ischemia trial is it was very, um, its accuracy was pretty limited for detecting left main and high risk coronary disease. And I think, you know, the issues with image quality um, are, you know, in some patients can be a challenge with that modality, but no, I agree with you. I think it's, I think stress echo is, is particularly in lower risk patients or those with known disease. It's, it's, it's certainly an excellent test. Uh, and I think the advantage of, you know, the, the thing that we don't get, you know, I think particularly if you know someone has good echo image quality. Um, and, and I think if you combine that with, with, with uh, ultrasound enhancing agents, and perhaps even in the future, strain imaging and things maybe maybe even better. Great, thank you. And from Al Stenusis, um, you did not discuss in detail the role of CTFFR. What is your preference regarding CTFFR versus PET or MR flow reserve? Well, you know, CT, I've been pretty critical of CTMR, uh, FFR, mainly with regards to its cost. Um, you know, I, I really had a challenge uh, with the fact that it was, it was, you know, several fold more costly than the index test itself. Um, that has come down. Um, we do CTFFR, we use CTFFR, um, but in select patients. And we would really only, we only use it in patients who have proximal lesions that are indeterminate, where you already have CT uh, data. And so you're debating, do I send this for CTFFR or do I do a whole nother test? And so in that scenario, um, we do use it. I think it's fairly helpful if it's normal. Uh, if the CTFFR is above 0.8, it's, if you look at the data, it's pretty, its sensitivity is pretty good. It's not very good with regards to its specificity, particularly in the 0.7 to 0.8 range. And it's not uncommon for us to see invasive FFRs that are normal in those populations. So we use it very, very selectively. I can't say that it's any, I mean, I think probably PET or MR are better tests because of all the other data that you get. Um, and, and I think certainly getting myocardial blood flow, for example, um, is, is, is extremely helpful. Uh, but if you're saying I have a, this lesion in front of me in the Prox LED, they've already had a CT scan and I would be willing to not cat this person or at least feel better about not cathing them if my CTFFR was normal. That's a reasonable use of the technology. In my opinion, I wish it weren't so costly, um, but that's kind of my thought. It's an imperfect test like any test. Um, uh, I don't think the data is really strong for using CTFFR in the, in the chest, in the acute population. The guideline writers did include it. There's not a lot of randomized clinical trial data in that population. They did include it mainly because I think, again, their, their mission was to keep people out of the cath lab. And there is some pretty um, large scale observational data showing it's safe to defer cath in those pop on those patients. And we know that a lot of people who end up in the emergency room while they're billed as acute chest pain often have just chronic symptoms that are worsening. And so we're doing a lot of chronic or, or labeling a lot of people as acute chest pain where it's more, more chronic. Great, thank you. And um, from Eric Velasquez, uh, thank you for an outstanding and balanced talk. Can we hear your perspective on the emerging role of cardiac CT in surgical cabbage planning 
and as a gatekeeper for presumed non-ischemic heart failure with reduced EF and in heart failure with preserved EF? Well, the, the, um, I'll take the, the, the last question. We, we, we know it's an appropriate indication to do CT to rule out coronary disease in patients with heart failure. It's, you know, I think there's a lot of advantages for doing MR in those populations. And so we tend to do that more frequently, um, given sometimes the need to know, you know, uh, LGE burden, um, you know, do they have a non-ischemic etiology, sarcoid and amyloid, et cetera, the things you can see on MR. Um, but if your goal is really just to rule out coronary disease, that is an appropriate indication for using CT. And we do that fairly frequently. Um, and, you know, I think again, you know, the reflexive referral of the patient with an EF of 25% to the cath lab should really stop. Um, I think we have non-invasive techniques with CT and MR and PET and others that can usually phenotype these patients very, very accurately. And, and along those lines, you know, quite frankly, sending the routine valve uh, patient to the cath lab to rule out coronary disease has probably got, got to stop. Um, we have better tests for that. And CT has a really good uh, high accuracy for that. And that's something we're now doing, you know, for our mitral valve repair patients. And then even in some of our, many of our pre-TAVR patients now doing CT. Now in cabbage planting, that's, that's kind of uh, not been super well studied. It is something that has been simulated. Uh, as you know, there are some clinical trials looking at decision-making, meaning can you take a CT and then say, well, I'm going to surgically revascularize this patient and not cath them. And that's, um, there have been some observational uh, studies. There's, you know, a site in Europe that did that. And they said people did fine, small numbers. Um, so I think, I think it is an emerging role. Uh, it's going to take some time and it's probably going to take some selectivity because you would really have to have good image quality, clear lesion severity. Of, of clear hemodynamic significance. Um, but in the right patients, could you take a CT and say, you know, I really need to cat this person. There's clearly left main disease and proximity disease and prox right corner disease. And you've got clear, good targets. Yes, you probably could do that in many patients and they would do just fine. And again, thinking of this as a non-invasive angiogram, the problem you run into is that many of the patients have such diffuse disease, um, it, you know, and, and, and in many of those uh, scenarios, I think surgeons just aren't comfortable yet using CT um, and, and the cath continues to be the, the preferred modality, but we'll see if that gets studied. I don't, I'm not aware of any, you know, there, there are some, there are some uh, small scale studies, but any large scale randomized trials. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Great to see you. Hopefully we'll see you in person sometime I, in the I near future. So. Yeah, hopefully we'll have you to back, back to your, your old stomping grounds here at UVA, Lawrence, and, and really appreciate the invitation. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care.